Hi, and welcome, everybody. My name is Travis. And like the like, uh, introduction said, I'm going to be talking about OpenStreetMap data. Um, just a really quick show of hands. Who out here has heard of OpenStreetMap? Great. So OpenStreetMap is a very popular project, and I'm really happy that you're here to learn about it with me today. Cool. So what exactly are we going to cover? Well, first off, we're going to talk about OpenStreetMap, um, kind of the community surrounding it, and get into the, what the data types are, how it's structured, and how you can kind of filter it and search through it. Um, after this, we're going to talk about um, PostgreSQL and how to work with geographic data in PostgreSQL, um, specifically focusing on the PostGIS plugin. And then we'll talk about how you get OpenStreetMap data into Postgres. And at the very end of the talk, we're going to talk about how you structure um, analysis projects with Python. And that'll be the most fun part of the talk, because obviously we're at PyCon conference. So, cool. so why am I giving this presentation? Um, so the idea for this talk started last year when I was doing research for my master thesis project. Um, and in my master thesis project, I was doing an analysis of walkability in the city of Kiel, Germany. And to do this, I used a lot of OSM data. And to kind of help keep myself structured and organized, I needed a process. I needed a, a kind of a way to keep the madness in order. And basically, this is what I came up with. And I'm really happy to share it with you today. And just a little bit more about who I am and where you can find me. So uh, first off, I have a website, TravisHathaway.com. I just want to let everybody know that you can go there after this talk to kind of see a blog article that is basically the mega tutorial that is this speech. So everything I say here, you'll be able to find there. Um, you can also find the example code that I use in this presentation on GitHub. You can find all the other stuff I do on GitHub. And if you want to get in touch with me, you can um, send me a message on LinkedIn. And then finally, um, if you want to hear all the kind of weird, bad music I write and make, you can go to SoundCloud. Um, so I always like to use, <laughs> get an opportunity to present that. And then who am I? Yeah, I'm above all, I'm a Python program. Uh, programmer, but also, too, I'm a GIS enthusiast. I've never actually worked as a professional kind of GIS practitioner, so to say. I've always been a software engineer, but I've always really done this as a hobby. Um, I'm also a social science scientist. I actually just recently completed a master's um, degree in um, the program was called Sustainability, Society, and the Environment, and it was really fun to kind of use my software skills to figure out how to kind of tackle um, social issues. And then last, I'm a guitarist and a musician. Very amateur, though. And so who are you, and who is this talk for? Basically, this talk is for anybody who has an interest in both Python, PostgreSQL, GIS, and especially you enjoy messing around with data. Um, the OpenStreetMap database is enormous, very, very big, and there's lots of really cool stuff going on there, and it's growing all the time. So, cool. All right. So let's kind of dive headfirst into OpenStreetMap, um, talk about what it is. Um, so what is OpenStreetMap? It's actually a huge community. And not only is it a community, but it's a community of communities. So all around the world, you have um, local chapters that are all um, dedicated to basically mapping out their communities and making this data open source and freely available to everyone to use. Um, so the contributors include individuals, just like you and I, um, but also public and private organizations, as well as local, state, and national governments. And if you go to the Wikipedia page, um, the list of contributors is actually mind-blowing. It's so big. Cool. Okay, so enough about the project itself. Um, let's get into the data types. So in OSM, um, OpenStreetMap, there are primarily three different data types. We have nodes, ways, and relations. Let's get into each. So first off, a node, think of it a node as a point. It's a point with a geographical space that has latitude, longitude, and node ID. Um, and so some common examples of what these things are include things like park benches, waste baskets, toilets, anything that's just a simple XY coordinate on a map. And then the next data type uh, is a little bit more complex. Um, we moved into the, in, from nodes to ways. So a way is actually just a collection of nodes, um, and they, ha they come in three different flavors. So the first one is an open way. In an open way, you can think of it as just a line. Um, and so these include things like streets and rivers and streams. And then we have two more different types of uh, um, ways, and these are closed ways and areas. So a closed way is basically a line, but it, it, um, it, it starts where it stops, right? And so these are things like roundabouts um, fall in this category. 
Um, and then the second thing we have are areas. And so these are what you would see on the map as uh, basically a polygon shape. And these include uh, parks, natural areas, as well as political boundaries. And as well as things like buildings too. And this would be a good kind of um, way, uh, a good point in the presentation to interject this statistic, is that OpenStreetMap is actually the largest database in the entire world of building footprints. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then finally, uh, we have what's known as a relation. And so relations basically provide a way to arbitrarily ne nest and kind of relate the first two types of data to each other. So with relations, you can group, group points, uh, nodes with each other. You can also group ways. Um, but also, too, um, some interesting kind of use cases um, emerge. So anything, any, any polygon that, is, uh, that has a circle in it, so for example, a lake with an island or a building footprint that has a little courtyard in the middle, that's going to be a relation because it's a polygon and then a closed um, way. And then um, next thing you have are university campuses. Um, so think any sort of, so a university campus isn't necessarily just one building, but it's multiple buildings. So um, in order to encapsulate that, um, we use a relation. And then the other thing too, is we're gonna put uh, bus routes there. And so these are open ways. So these are all like lines that are grouped together to express a single thing. Cool. And then finally, we've got all this great data, but how do we categorize it and how do we search through it? Well, um, OpenStreetMap has a, a, a system of tagging, and, and at its heart, it's basically just a simple key value store. Um, and we can use this to categorize nodes, ways, and relations. And from the OpenStreetMap wiki, it says you are free to create any tag you like. So it's supposed to be really, really versatile. Um, anybody can submit stuff um, that they want. But the thing is, is that if you try to go all willy-nilly and create whatever you want, you might run into some, you know, because there's other people that use it too, and the community has informal standards for this. And so if you're using a tag, but there's clearly a better alternative available that more people are using, then you're going to be gently kind of uh, pushed into using it in that direction. But with that being said, if you are able to find a new tag, and this hasn't been used before, and then all of a sudden there's a big demand for it, and, it, and your tag kind of catches on and people start using it, well, this is a way for it to kind of informally, um, yeah, become a standard. Um, and the last thing I want to mention about tags is that, yes, it has this informal way of being adopted and being adopted in the community, but there's also a formal process to making changes with tags, and so anybody can go on the OpenStreetMap wiki and they can submit a proposal, and then these proposals go through various stages, including votes and all that kind of stuff, before it's uh, officially adopted. Cool. And so here are some example tags. So the first one um, is called amenity. And amenity is really popular because it includes all of kind of things that are typically useful to people or places that people want to go. So some example values here are going to be cinema, post box, town hall, and waste baskets, because everybody needs waste baskets. Um, and then the second thing we have um, is, a, is a tag called land use. And land use um, might be more interesting to people doing environmental research because it's going to have values such as commercial, industrial, residential, but it's also going to have things such as farmland and forest. And so you can do um, some really interesting environmental analysis um, in OpenStreetMap with that tag alone. Cool. All right, so just to explain all this data, sounds great. How do I get my hands on it? Well, uh, OpenStreetMap has a system of mirrors available. To see the full list of mirrors, you can go to OpenStreetMap.org, um, and they have basically a big list of, of a bunch of different types of mirrors. Um, my personal recommendation, though, is um, uh, it's a mirror called Geofabrik, and they they make um, they have the best organized organization of this data. Um, basically, when you go to the page, you're presented with a list of continents, and you can kind of drill down and go deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, it's really nice. But the other thing too is that um, sometimes this website is down. Um, so apparently, these guys need some love. Um, let's uh, let's looking let's look at supporting them because they actually provide a really really great service. So yeah, really happy for them. Cool. And then um, once you get the data and you download it, um, there's actually a specific type of binary format that OSM uses called the PBF. Um, and so this, um, before there were several other formats such as XML, you can actually even download these files as shape files. Um, but as far as community standards goes and interoperability with all the different tool sets out there, uh, this PBF format is the recommended one. And it's going to be the fastest to process. 
All right. So now we've covered the basics of OpenStreetMap data. Um, how do we actually work with this in PostgreSQL? So before we do that, what I want to do is talk about well, what is what is actually even geospatial in Postgres anyway, right? And so, like many things in the open source community, the PostGIS um, plugin that I'm going to talk about was kind of a confluence of a lot of good ideas. Um, so PostGIS um, started back in about 2001, and one of the th key things that made PostGIS possible um, was Postgres's extension system. Because um, extensions were so easy to create, the initial PostGIS plugin was actually written in under a month and just included just basic geographic data types. Um, and so they kept chugging along, but the problem was, was that although they had these awesome data types now for PostgreSQL, they had no way to kind of perform any sort of geospatial analysis. And so this is where projects like the o Open Geospatial Consortium come in, and also another open source library called libgeos. And, um, with the simple features for SQL standard defined, and also, too, the, the libgeos, um, um, basically it's a C++ library providing all of the algorithms for implementing these kind of um, um, geospatial analysis. And so when I say that, these are things like, you know, if you have a polygon, like how do you figure out how many, all the points inside this polygon? And so because of these two other organizations and projects, um, these were able to be easily and uh, kind of incorporated into PostGIS and then later on, once they had that, then we had basically a full suite of geospatial operations in PostGIS. Um, the other thing I want to mention, too, is that PostGIS as, adds the uh, um, spatial data types, it has the spatial processing functions, and it also has um, basically spatial indexes as well. Cool. And so what do these data types actually look like in PostgreSQL? Well, we have a root geometry object. And then below that, we have points, line strings, and polygons. And then on the same level, we have something called a geometry collection. And below that, we have multipoint, multiline, and multipolygon. And so those are basically all the, the data types. There's some other geography stuff too, but I'm not going to get into that in this presentation. And so how do these um, data types then map to the data types that we just saw with OpenStreetMap? Well, luckily, it's pretty simple. It's basically a one-to-one -one mapping. So for nodes, that goes to a point. Open ways and closed ways are, are represented as line strings. Um, areas are represented as polygons. And all these relations I'm talking about um, can be represented as multi-polygon, multi-line string. Cool. That's pretty simple. And so now you might be asking yourself, well, how do I write a geospatial query? Eh, sorry. We don't have enough time for that. <laughs> but what I'm going to say to you, because that's basically a whole presentation in itself, what I'm going to say to you is go to postgis.net check out the introduction. It's amazing. It's, it's quite literally like a 30-chapter introduction, and they work with um, the, some US census data. So it's actually you're working with real data, learning how to run these PostGIS queries. I would highly recommend checking that out. And again, like I said, if you go to my website and go to my blog, you, you will find a link there. And on my blog article, I actually do give a little bit of a rough intro to writing spatial queries as well. But that's when the real fun starts. All right, so now that we know kind of, OK, a little bit more about spatial types in PostGIS and how it relates with OSM. Now we want to know how do we actually get this data into our database. Um, so there's a, a variety of tools out there, and I'm going to introduce two of them to you. The first one is a tool called Osmium, and this is a command line tool um, with lots of functions. It's basically a Swiss army knife of OSM data. And with this tool, you can do diffs, extracts, merge, and filters, all um, using this uh, PBF format that they have. And so what does an example command look like? Um, so this is an Osmium command that uh, filters all of the, um, it basically filters all the amenities out of this large uh, PBF file, um, this Germany latest. And just to give you an idea of how large this file is when you download it, the, 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 the OpenStreetMap data file for Germany right now is about 3.6 gigabytes. So it's a pretty large file. Um, and so the second tool um, that you can use to get the stuff into um, <clears throat> uh, PostgreSQL is something called OSM to PG SQL. Um, and so this is a command line tool that you can use to import OSM data, but it also has uh, two different modes of operation, including um, creating and updating. And um, as of uh, version 1.5, it supports um, complex rules um, via Lewis scripts that we're going to talk about a little bit later. 
And so here's what an example um, use of this function looks like. Um, so you just tell it which database um, you want the data to be imported to, and then you also give it a PDF file. And then when you import it, you're going to get this kind of list of default tables. And so it's going to be line, so this planet OSM line, planet OSM point, and then planet OSM polygon, and rows. And so this is really cool for if you just want to kind of dig in and do some exploratory data analysis. And I definitely recommend this at first. Um, but as you kind of start working on a project, um, the names of these tables aren't very semantic. They, they, they don't really tell you what's in there. It's just line, point, polygon. So it's not actually, so it might be really hard to um, categorize and make your table schema nice, um, which is really important if you're going to start any project with a database. It's always nice to have a really nice, clean looking um, database schema, which isn't always the case, um, as I've seen in many projects. But yeah, so. How do we solve this problem? Well, with um, OSM to PG PGSQL, um, there is a um, ability to have a flexible input. And so this is what I was talking about earlier with the Lewis scripts. And so um, in order to do this, you basically specify output flex, and then you use the style flag to point it to um, your Lewis script. And then I'm going to show you an example of what a Lewis script looks like. And actually, a quick show of hands. How many people have ever done any programming at all in Lua? Awesome. That's cool. So I, I, and I think you should know that. But Lua is a very, it's a really simple language. Um, a lot of times you'll find it embedded into other things. Um, I believe it's also available in Redis, but don't hold me on that. But yeah, so um, but yeah. But let's get back to the, the, the slide at hand. So in order to define um, your tables, you're going to create um, a variable called tables. And then um, below, you just define uh, what each one of those tables is going to look like. Um, and so the first one we'll define is an amenity polygon. And then we give it the name here. And then what we do is we kind of map um, some of the values to um, a Postgres values. And so what we're going to do is we're going to store the type of amenity. We're going to store all the other tags associated with this. And actually, that's a good point to mention, too. So nodes, ways, and relations, they can have multiple tags. So they can be quite, quite rich and quite detailed filled. Um, yeah, and so then finally, what we'll do is we're going to define a geometry column there and then give a default projection. And then um, and another thing I'll, I'll mention, too, is when you're importing OSM data um, with the tool, by default, it's using the 3857 which gives you um, your coordinate system in meters rather than degrees, like latitude and longitude, which can be actually a lot better. At first, you kind of look at that data and you think, OK, these huge numbers, I don't know what they mean. But um, it's really nice when you can use meters, because then you can actually more easily transfer it to kind of real world uh, measurements, such as kilometers. So yeah, because the, the conversion from meters to kilometers is easier than degrees to kilometers. So. And then um, below, we're going to define then a second um, table for our points and um, doing basically the same thing. And then one thing I wanted to note, too, when you use the flex output, um, you can't store points and polygons um, beside each other. They have to kind of go to their own separate tables. So cool. All right. And then um, so in, usually in the upper part, you're going to kind of define what you want your tables to look like. And then below, you have these kind of hook functions where you can um, basically just define what you want when you're going to be importing something. So here I've defined a hook function for processing a node. And it does a really simple thing. It's just going to say, hey, if this object's tags amenities thing is, is not null, then we want you to go ahead and import it. But because you can use if statements here, I mean, these can get as complicated as you'd like. Um, yeah, and I'm going to link later to a really great um, Git repo where someone's built a lot of really amazing um, Lua examples that you can use. So, so you don't have to start from zero if you don't want to write that much Lua. <laughs> cool. And so then when you, um, after you've basically done this import, you can see that our table schema looks a bit better now. Now we have um, all of our data organized by the type of data that they are. So we have amenity points and amenity polygons. All right, 
And so now we're getting into the best part of the talk, because it's the Python part of the talk. Very cool. So organizing your projects with Python. How, how do we even like go about doing something like that? Well, let's go ahead and, and organize this as if we're completing a task. So you've just been given a task, and you won a contract. Um, you've, you've bid, you've bid, there are all kinds of bidders, but you've eventually won this contract. And it's a lucrative contract, too. You're getting millions of dollars for this. So this is, or millions of euros. It's going to be really cool. And it's a contract with Trash Cans United. They're a trash can advocacy group. And they want to do trash can research in Germany. And you're going to be their eyes and ears on the ground. <laughs> so for this project, what they require is they want to know a the statistics for all the trash cans in the 10 largest cities in Germany. Um, and they also want to know, well, like, what's the number of trash cans over time? You know, they, they, they're probably going to want to come back to you um, every year. And, and you're thinking to, this, you're, to yourself, you're thinking, wow, this is great. This is a contract that I'm going to be able to get money for every year. Awesome. And then, um, and then the other thing they want to do is they say, yeah, well, Travis, you know, at first we're going to want trash can info for the top you know, 10 cities, but, you know, over time, this could grow, and we maybe would, maybe we even build a trash can dashboard on our website, this, and so all these things, and your mouth's getting wet at this point, because you're like, oh, I mean, you just see dollar signs in your eyes, because you're really, you're really ready to work on this, and, and for some reason, now you love trash cans, so <laughs> let's get into it, um, but before we, we get started with this, right, let's, let's see what this data pipeline kind of looks like. Um, and so for this data pipeline specifically, we're going to want to initially get um, some data from Geofabrik, and then we're going to store that in um, an initial PDF file. And then afterwards, what we'll do is we're going to extract all the cities that we care about, so the top 10 um, in Germany. And then we're going to basically write that to a, 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 our own kind of project data file. And, then at, and at the end, we're going to want to import it into a Postgres database. And then from there, we can write all the kind of reports that we're going to need and um, output this as diagrams and then send it to Trash Cans United. Cool. But the, uh, the thing is, though, is that I, I just I don't know how I'm going to go about organizing this. I, I think maybe well, I, I could write a, well, a web application, but eh, that seems a little overkill, you know? It's, I don't even, I, I don't know if I want to go there yet. And then so you're thinking, ah, like, how, how could I possibly do it? You, what, what's that, Obi-Wan? Use the, use the CLI? Yeah, <laughs> that, that makes sense because what, what did we just see? We just saw two awesome, you know, CLI programs, Osmium and OSM to PG SQL. Why not write our own? and throw that in the mix. That sounds like a great idea. But, and I hope this doesn't describe any of you here, but maybe some of you hear the word CLI and you think, <laughs> you think this, right? No? <laughs> okay, let me, let, me, let me go ahead and just kind of assuage your concerns, right? Uh, why are CLIs great? All right, so why is writing a CLI a good idea? So this enables kind of rapid development, fast feedback cycles, right? So you're writing it, and you could test it, write it, run it, write it, run it. And when you're doing that, it's really important because then you can kind of see your changes over time and just have a really, a really fast feedback cycle so that you can um, develop quite quickly. Um, the other thing, too, is that these tools can be integrated with other tools, right? They're composable. So the other tools we just saw, Osmium and OSM to PG SQL, they can be included as part of, like, um, of, of a data pipeline, like we just saw. And then the other thing, too, is that um, recently, and I'm sure a lot of you know this, but the, but the CLI library out there, the ecosystem for Python, is, is amazing. And it's also amazing across a bunch of other libraries. Um, so my personal favorites in this realm are um, Click and Rich. They make, I mean, Click is great because it can help you structure your CLI programs. And rich can help make them beautiful. So there's a lot of really good tools out there. And uh, yeah, that's, that's how we're going to do it. And so um, our CLI program is going to be called, in kind of the OSM spirit, everything should begin. All, all CLI tools should begin with OSM. So it's going to be called <laughs> OSM Proj, which stands for OSM Project Management. And then um, specifically what we're going to do is we're going to have a, a, an initial command called OSM Proj Prepare. So this is going to do the downloading and extraction process. And then we're going to have OSM Proj report. 
and that's going to do our reporting process. And the cool thing is because OSM to PG SQL is already such an amazing kind of tool, it's going to handle the importing for us. So really excited about that. And so when we write the program, well, what does the actual like, file structure layout look like? Um, so this is just one example, um, and this is my personal preference for how I like to do this stuff. But um, we're going to have a kind of top-level folder called OSM Proj, and then below that, um, we're going to have a folder called Commands. And so whenever I'm writing um, kind of command line tools that have these kind of subcommands here, like prepare and report, I'm always going to basically dedicate separate files to them. It makes the project really easy and nice and orderly, and, and you're able to find everything quite quickly. Um, and then we move further down. Um, basically, we're going to have this CLI. So this is going to be where the entry point to our CLI program lives. And then finally, um, I'm going to have separate modules for doing things with databases and separate modules for doing things with HTTP. Um, so I like to organize my modules in terms of services. Um, so for example, if you go to the, the, the uh, repository website, you're going to also see other things such as um, report or chart or cache. So every kind of new service has its own separate module. And then finally, um, I'm for packaging and doing everything, I'm using Poetry right now. And so that's going to all live, all that config is going to live in a Py um, project um, Toml. And then finally, every good project needs an even better README. So always include that README. Cool. And so now we're going to get into kind of the nitty gritty of like what these commands actually look like. So for OSM prepare, um, we're going to basically, uh, oops, excuse me. It's going to be um, a command that accepts a config. And inside this config is going to be all the cities that we want to extract. And then um, this uh, second argument here is this Europe Germany. And this kind of roughly maps to the way these things are kind of passed on, on Geofabrik. So that's going to enable us to download, um, store that quite easily. And then finally, we're going to have an output um, file. So it's going to be our project.data. And so inside of this uh, config file is um, going to live, it's a, it's a JSON file, it's going to hold the extracts. And this is also the same um, format that the Osmium tool accepts. And also I should mention right now that underneath the covers, um, prepare is actually calling basically two Osmium commands. We're calling extract and merge. Um, so we're basically downloading everything, and then we extract all the cities that we want. And at the very end, we merge everything in together to get that project data. And also, too, and then and, and the really cool thing is that you can write these Python programs um, and use subprocess. And in my opinion, writing a Python program like this is um, much better than writing a bash script. So yeah, that's just my personal opinion, and I think uh, maybe some of you would agree. Cool. All right, and so now let's get uh, talk about, like, OK, what does the reporting look like? And so for the reporting, we're going to have a couple different things going on. So first, um, we want to define the top cities. And we'll define that as a, like a shell, shell variable. But really, what we're doing is just passing it in later as an argument. But this is a nice little shorthand to do that. Um, and then uh, we have the same config. And in this config, we're going to hold things like a database connection. Um, so we don't have to pass in everything on the command line. So that's another nice thing to do. And then um, this is kind of the meat and potatoes of this specific report. So the reports are going to hold these kind of sub-reports. And the, this is called amenity city. And then it accepts two different types of arguments. It's going to accept the city's argument and then also the amenity that you want to measure. Um, and for us, it's going to be wastebasket because we're doing trash can research. And then finally, um, we have an output type, right? And so this output type is going to be a chart. And then what this does is it's going to use um, the Plotly library to write us a nice looking HTML chart. Um, but the cool thing is, and I'll talk about this later, is that with this output type, right, you can, you can throw anything you want at it, right? You can do a terminal output. Um, if it's going to be used for a web map, you can do a GeoJSON output. So this is really cool. And when you kind of start thinking about your programs like this, right, you can start thinking modularly, right, and, and, and how you want to extend it. And so when you want to add a new output type there, it's as easy as just adding a new type. So. Oh, yeah. Actually, wait. I, I hope no one saw that. So actually, before I show that next graph, does anyone who, who thinks, w w and, and maybe everyone saw it, but who thinks is the city with the most trash cans in Germany? Yeah? Anyone know? OK. I'll, I'll go ahead and show you. But basically, um, the number one city in Germany is Stuttgart, closely followed by München, and then Berlin, and then Köln. And also, too, I want to let you know that this is the amenity per square kilometer. So this is kind of an imperfect measurement, right? But it's 
yeah, so basically Stuttgart has 11.93, basically 12 trash cans per square kilometer. Um, so that's how you can read that. And yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. Um, this was just kind of thrown together quite quickly. Um, moving on and getting an actual like, better analysis here, I think uh, that you would want to bring in population density. Um, that would be another good thing to do. Um, yeah, but this is just super, super simple. And this is actually, so population density, I'd have to bring another data set, but this is just using all the data that's available in OpenStreetMaps. And then, um, like I said before, when you can utilize different outputs, and especially using something like Rich, you can generate these like nice, beautiful tables on the terminal. Uh, so that's really cool. And then you can yeah, yeah, add more data, right? So the actual number. Um, so if we looked at like total numbers, um, Berlin um, wins by far. It's got 7,489 trash cans, <laughs> which is a lot, but it's also the biggest city. But the other thing too is um, when we're looking at this data as well, right? Um, this is a good point to mention this about kind of OSM data is that it, just because, <clears throat> you know, what you see here, you have to remember because it's community and contributed data. So if we look at Leipzig, okay, we could say, yo, man, there's barely any trash cans in Leipzig. You know, they only have like two per square kilometers. But the thing is, is maybe they haven't been tracking them as well as Stuttgart. So um, just remember when you, when you go digging into OSM, you need to also be verifying by either doing like kind of using in situ me measurements where you're um, basically looking on the ground or verifying it with another data set or even trying to see, okay, who is actually contributing the data, like the trash can data. Um, and all that you, you should be able to do on their website where you can actually see who contributed to that. And if you go to openstreetmap.org, um, you can click on individual features and see who the actual contributor was. So, yeah. cool. Cool, and so, um, yeah, one of the last things I wanted to talk about was kind of sharing your work with others. Um, and this is where um, writing CLIs and um, kind of thinking in this way can really help when you want others to either help out or extend um, the project that you've done. So I highly encourage people to, from the outset, right, think about how they're going to package and share um, their work with others. And one of the one of the really great ways is to use a kind of a like a a tool like Poetry in order to help you build Python packages and put them on PyPI um, if you'd like to make it public and open source. But even if you, if, if you don't want to make it public or open source and just have it be private, um, tools like this can be really, really useful um, for getting people started. Yeah. Um, and let's see. So, yeah, and then uh, I guess the, so this is one of the last slides I want to show in this is why you would use this method. And so, like our project requirements said earlier, is that they, they gave us initial specifications, but they, they, they kind of had this like MVP, right? The minimum viable product they wanted. But then um, what they wanted to do is scale up, maybe add new reports, maybe add different kinds of reports, add new cities. Um, so this method would be great if you're dealing with adapting kind of project specifications, right? You, you want to, I mean, that, that's the whole idea about good software design is that you build software to be flexible to changing kind of circumstances. And that's a really, really cool way to kind of build your analysis projects too. Um, the other thing is that you can use this method if you want to run this repeatedly. So you're going to need to run this on a server or in a Docker container or maybe in some sort of like GitHub action or so something like that, right? You want it to have like kind of robots do this for you. But the cool thing is, is when you write CLIs, right? CLIs are friendly to robots, but they're also friendly to humans too, which is cool. Um, and like I said before, it helps you um, to kind of share your code. And then furthermore, and this is the last point I'll talk about is, um, when you write programs in this way, it can kind of help instill, you know, best practices in software design. Um, so for me personally, when I first started my analysis project last year, um, it was initially done using kind of JupyterLab and Jupyter Notebooks. And while this is really great for exploratory data analysis, and I still, and if I'm just kind of want a proof of concept, just kind of do something really quick, I'll go to that. But I also had the problem where the Jupyter Notebooks eventually got so big that I just kind of, I was super confused 
by them, and they don't have all the nice things that you get from an IDE, right, like code linting um, and those kinds of things. So what I, what I, now in my workflow is what I try to do is that, yeah, Jupyter Notebook's an amazing place just to kind of sketch things out, but as soon as I have a really clear idea of what I want the project to be, I, I jump right back into an IDE and I start planning my projects in this way. So, but that's my own personal experience. Um, and I know there's going to be some great talks on Jupiter, and I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to them too. So, cool, cool. I'm not, I'm not trying to dog on Jupiter, but it's just it's, for my personal workflow, that's usually what I'm doing. Exploratory data analysis there, and then when I have everything kind of cemented, I'm moving to an IDE to really yeah, plan every, everything out. All right, and so these are the resources that you can go check out. Um, so like I said, my blog site's gonna have them there. Um, but then there's also some further resources um, available below. Um, and then yeah, I think I briefly mentioned it, but really this, um, it's uh, this PG OSM project, PG OSM Flex has tons and tons of like great Lua examples. Their whole idea is that they really want to kind of create an analysis ready database. So even more so than these Lua-like scripts, they also have like a Docker image that you can use to kind of quickly just get um, a database and begin connecting to it and doing analysis. So I really would recommend um, checking that project out. And then like I said before, the introduction to PostGIS um, is really great too. And then further, and the other thing too um, is this tag info uh, website that I may have briefly mentioned. But tag info is cool because you can look at all the different tags in OpenStreetMap, but then you can see how many are used. And so you can start to get an idea of, okay, how popular is this tag and how, how widespread is its use. So cool, and I believe that does it. So thank everybody for listening to my talk. Thanks, uh, Travis, uh, for this interesting talk. And unfortunately, uh, given the delay on the opening session, we do not have a time for the questions. But you can uh, ask your question directly to Travis, I think, here in the conference after the talk. And uh, thanks for being here. And enjoy the next talk in the conference. Cool. Thank you, everybody.